Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars now for over a year and a half. And today, my guest returning, as always, we love to have her back, is Rebecca Husted. So welcome, Rebecca. Thanks for joining me yet again. People love your webinars, and, and it's always so important. Sometimes a little shocking when we get done, like, uh, better go out and check. But it's always great to have you. This one may be better than ever. <laughs> oh, God. All right, so because I messed up on the topic when I put it up in Zoom, tell everybody what the topic is, a little bit about your background, and we'll get going. Let me go ahead and share my screen, and we'll talk about social license to operate and equine welfare. And that is something that is an upcoming topic. It's been a huge topic of contention in many other places, and I think as social media is evolving, we are seeing a lot of questions about these things. This may be a brand new term to some of our folks here in the United States, and that's why I'm trying to bring it through your webinars because you get so much coverage. And our key assumption today is gonna be that the horse is the key stakeholder in this whole thing. So let's talk a little bit about social license to operate and equine welfare. We're just trying to explore the relationship. Um, this is something that has been, been coming around for a while. So. First of all, um, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of full disclosure uh, before I talk about some of these things. I want you to know I do own horses. I do ride them. Um, I am also involved working with law enforcement and, and teach law enforcement officers in some uh, aspects of equine abuse, cruelty, and neglect. Um, we use our personal horses in technical large animal demonstrations. I ask them to lay down on the ground and, and pull them around with, with webbing. Um, they let us do all kinds of crazy things with them, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. I do own three walking horses. I refuse to use the Tennessee de designation. Mine are barefoot and I do not compete. Um, I've had them for many years. Uh, I occasionally use a carriage horse. I hire them for tourism and enjoyment uh, to see other places. I attend shows. I go to events. I fox hunt occasionally, barrel racing, horse sports, and I'm also a member of PATH International's Equine Welfare Committee. And you're gonna see why some of that is important when uh, we go through some of the subjects here. So for an example, let's talk about social license to operate and some of the organizations and uh, things that we do with horses that are extremely positive and have excellent social license to operate. And can, one example can, would be- Rebecca, can you the, just define social license to operate for those who- I sure can. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Never mind. Here we go. <laughs> okay, I was like, whoa. I'm just using the, these guys as, a, as an intro. You're exactly right. I should know right that you're, you're on it. Okay. <laughs> And, and and everybody, when we see pictures of people doing uh, EAAT kinds of things where we're using therapeutic riding, those kind of things, it generally gets people to smile and they go, wow, that's awesome. It's great for people. It's great for horses, all those kind of things. So they're probably some of the, the examples that have a really good example of social license to operate. And so what is that social license to operate? It basically means that it automatically exists. It's sort of a legal kind of thing where an organization or an entity or an, even an individual has an ongoing relationship with the community that they can do what they're doing. Um, it's sort of rooted in some of the perceptions and beliefs that we may have, uh, usually our employees or volunteers, um, other stakeholders uh, about that entity. Um, and it's really granted by the community. Um, the thing that's been interesting is over the years, as we learn more about social license, and this is something that I've just been learning about for the last couple of years due to some friends of mine that are, that are really moving it forward. It's really an intangible kinds of thing. And over the years, what we're trying to do is to get a little bit better at measuring those beliefs and opinions and perceptions. And this is something that's been really in, in some of the um, business aspects uh, outside of the equestrian industry, there's a lot of uh, information about social license to operate. So it's sort of a new thing to the horse industry, um, but the basic thing here is it's an unwritten, non-legally binding contract that's given by society as our quote, right to operate. It really is about building trust and that the members are gonna behave ethically and we all have the responsibility to cultivate that social license. So what that means is all of us are sort of in this together. And 
Uh, that can be a little bit difficult because I'm going to show you some of the other folks that we're in bed together with. And uh, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say that, but I'm going to use that as an example. So this is one that also always generates good things. This is some of the kids that I work with. I don't even like the kids, hasn't Wendy, changed. but... Oh, there we go. <laughs> it was a little delayed. If you have horses, you know you're going to be around kids. So even though I say I don't like kids, uh, of course I enjoy, I get great joy out of exposing my uh, friends and their kids to horses in a correct manner so that they have fun and they don't get hurt and those kind of things. Uh, finding good homes for some of our rescue horses that we take in through some of the uh, Georgia, uh, I'm associated with Georgia Equine Rescue League, and we end up taking in horses. And I love being able to find a good home for a horse and putting it in the right place and having a kid, you know, grow up just loving horses because you and I, we were lucky, you know, we, we've had horses all our lives and we just love them. So those are an example of a good social license to operate. Generally, when you show pictures of kids riding horses, everybody smiles, everybody thinks that's great. And whether it's on social media or talking to your friends, nobody turns around and says, oh my goodness, that's awful that you're you know, putting kids on horses. What? So that doesn't happen. So uh, other examples as we grow older, uh, equestrian sports, that's something that a lot of people get into is the idea. And this just happens to be some pictures that I randomly pulled from Tokyo uh, as we're moving through dressage and into eventing um, this week at, at Tokyo. Uh, I thought this was great this morning. Charlotte put up a, a picture on their website and Horse and Hound did too, of her opting to wear a helmet at the trot up for the Olympics. And I thought that was great. And it's all over social media. And even people who are not equestrians are seeing that and they're discussing it. And that's gonna be important because those kinds of perceptions are part of our social license to operate. When people say, wow, that's great. or why are they even discussing that? Uh, other examples of social, you know, license, uh, various sports, whether it's uh, Western pleasure or dressage or eventing or raining, um, those kind of things. The problem for us as human beings is, I don't know about you, Wendy, but have you ever noticed that sometimes dressage people say, those Western pleasure people, they're over there jerking on their horses' faces. And what do the Western pleasure people do? They go, Look at those dressage people. They're over there jerking on their horses' faces and roll core and doing all these kind of things, right? So those discussions and arguments or um, pot shots that we take at each other um, in within the horse industry, that might have been okay in the old days before there was so much exposure to these kind of things. But now that we have these discussions and it sometimes rolls over into the public and people who are not horse people, um, Generally, I mean, you ask anybody about walking horses and people have an opinion. They know what they are. And they know about big lick horses and those kind of things. Um, if you ask somebody about uh, FEI rules for whether or not they're supposed to have their whiskers on, they may not know, but they will know about things like walking horses. And they may have an opinion about rodeo and they may have an opinion about um, eventing horses and those kind of things. So what that means is it's getting out into the public. And that means that our social license to operate does have the potential to be affected by the public. So, of course, the big thing that affects anything, uh, I, I, I usually use the quote, if there's one dollar that changes hands or if there's the possibility of a blue ribbon, that changes everything, right? And what that means is, is our business models um, really have to think about social license to operate because it's very important. And our society over the last, particularly the hundred so years since we started getting cars and, and tractors and we stopped using horses. I mean, Wendy, you think back, it was only a hundred and you know, two or three generations ago that everybody had horses. You had to have a horse to get to town. You had to have a cart to get to town. My next door neighbor who was born in 1921 up in South Carolina, he went to school, his sister drove the cart and they drove to school and she tied the horse up and they went to class all until two o'clock in the afternoon. And then they drove that horse home. He just stood out there for six hours tied to a tree. And that was perfectly normal. But our society at large has really reimagined our horses. And part of the reimagining has been through TV and media and the things that people see on TV, and of course, I'm usually complaining because, and horse people always do, and Wendy, I'm sure you've had these discussions. You're sitting with your friends and you're talking about some movie that has horses in it, and you're like, oh my, goodness, that's not how you 
do whatever, okay? I am always complaining about don't put a blindfold on a horse even though it was in the movies because that's a dumb way to catch a, catch a horse and lead it out of a barn fire. But there's so many other dumb things that happen in movies, right? And usually it's for entertainment. It's not educational. So because of that, however, there's a lot of people out there in the world. It's amazing how many people think that a, a blindfold is the right thing to do to lead it out of a barn fire that are not even in the horse industry. You ask just about anybody and that's what they'll think because they watch those movies. So what that means is our society really doesn't consider the horse um, as a servant, as a comrade, uh, or even a worker in lots of places. To, to, to many of us, we say that our horses are our babies, our horses are part of our family, and that's true for many of us. I don't have two-legged kids, I've got four-legged kids. So there's, then you get the other side, which is people are starting to ask, well, our horses even, should they be ridden? Should they be driven? Or do we actually own animals? And that sort of starts getting into the animal, uh, not welfare things, but animal rights side. But they're asking those questions and it affects us and our horses too. So what that means is we are the industry and we really are responsible for this social license to operate. And it rests with all of this. It's not just the judges. It's not somebody on some committee somewhere. It's not FEI. It's not just the owners or riders. It's all of us. And if you're part of the horse industry in any way, if you're uh, moving horses, if you're feeding horses, if you're the guy selling feed down at the, at the feed store, you are part of the industry. You're part of the perception. You're part of this whole concept of the responsibility um, for social license to operate. So then the next thing, and I am not going to get into this in, in a lot of detail, Wendy, but I want to remind everybody that there are regulations, no matter what country you're in. I uh, happen to have an example of the UK uh, practice for the, for the welfare of post horses, ponies, donkeys, and their hybrids. Um, but, you know, when you get here in the USA, it gets a lot more complicated. So there's guidance on the upper right from the American Horse Council about what our National Welfare Code of Practice should be for equines. And then there's the Horse Protection Act. Well, the Horse Protection Act really should say Tennessee Walking Horse Protection Act because it doesn't have to do with anything except horses that could be soared for um, those kinds of shows. There are a couple other breeds that do some showing that may be affected by that, but generally it's a small um, group and it started back in 1970. And then you look at the Animal Welfare Act and you say, hey, how does that affect horses? Well, really it has to do with horses and circuses. It has to do with horses that may be shown, um, those kind of things. But it was intended for things where you're keeping them in zoos, circuses, those kind of things. We really don't have uh, an overall encompassing legislation that tells us how to provide real welfare for horses here in the United States, which is sort of funny. Um, USDA does some stuff and APHIS does some stuff and Animal Care does some stuff, but it's really pretty distracted here in the United States. And that may be why we have some concerns for our social license to operate because um, they, you know, how dressage does some things and how Western Pleasure does some things and how rodeo does some things and how you cowboy out in the West does some things. Um, but really we're all in this together and we're not perceiving that. And how many people are actually members of the American Horse Council? Usually the large organizations, but not the individuals. Um, and I don't know about you, Wendy, but in my state, we have a Georgia Horse Council, but it's pretty small and it's not a regulatory industry organization. It just tries to provide some education and it's not real strong. And that's, that's frustrating and, and concerning to me because we don't have a way to sort of pull the industry together very well. And we end up pulling each other apart so much that that makes it really difficult. And the last question on all these things, I don't care what kind of legislation you've got. Um, and it's this, the same thing here too for FEI, whether it's sport and recreation or if it's general, is it really care or is it welfare that we're looking at? They call it welfare because that sounds good. But saying that thou shalt house the horse, uh, groom the horse, make sure a vet takes care of the horse, that's care. That's not really welfare. And there's a, there's, there's a not well-defined line between care and welfare. And that's where we get ourselves in trouble. 
Um, these are, it seems like semantics sometimes to try to find the differences between those things. But what we're really looking for is welfare, where the horse feels better. The horse enjoys his life better. That's really um, where I'm looking at from welfare. So when we think about social license to operate, I'm gonna use myself as an example. My ex-husband and I, we have been involved with technical large animal emergency rescue for many, many years. And I have very sweet, wonderful horses that are willing to work for treats. This is examples of the black horse in the mud there is Sancho back in about 2007. And the, the paint up there <laughs> hanging in a sling is doing that for treats. Uh, she is not sedated. Neither one of these horses is sedated. They were willing to do it. Um, and we were doing these trainings. We didn't have mannequins and those kinds of things. But in the beginning, when we started doing this, we were doing it for free. And then, you know, over time, we were doing so much of this, we had to start charging, we had to start paying for our bills, and we started a corporation. So at that point, we started looking around saying, hey, uh, you know, money's starting to change hands. How are people going to perceive this? We had a few people at some of our trainings that were sort of raising their eyebrows and saying, hey, why are you putting your horse in the mud? Um, and of course, it was all for good things, and we were always very careful. We never had any problems, but that becomes, you know, is this exploitation or is this true partnership? And I love the behavior side of uh, working with these animals to get them willing to do these kinds of things. It's a huge cha training challenge for me, and I love doing those kind of things. But at some point, we had to make a decision. And what we were doing is we were looking at how do people perceive what we're doing? Um, our level of social license, the green being the psychological identification where you say, hey, you know, I'm politically going to support this person or this, this entity. Uh, I feel awesome. I want to volunteer for this organization. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight against their critics because I believe in what they're doing. And then, of course, going up towards the red, which is where your social license has basically been withheld or withdrawn which means you're enduring legal challenges, you're having violence and boycotts and shutdowns and blockades and everything you do gets blocked by someone and people have negative associations with that. And then of course, Wendy, it's just like anything else, there's some yellow and some orange in between. You know, um, how much approval do you have? If, you're, if, if your company is still seen as a good neighbor and generally you have social license, that's approval and support. But then there also is sort of acceptance and tolerance where, you know, you start having to have outside NGOs looking at what you're doing. You start having USDA looking in and asking questions. Law enforcement gets start getting involved. Uh, people start really raising cane and that really becomes where you're losing some of your level of social license. Well, so I hope that makes, go Rebecca, ahead. Uh, don't, I mean, that in terms of an example of this, I think the carriage horses, uh, in cities is an example of this where, yes. um, you know, for Absolutely. me, I always, right I here. remember, oh. <laughs> yeah. You're exactly right. That's um, exactly right. And I'm glad you brought it up. So I'm going to go ahead and accelerate to here yeah. because they have those challenges to their social license to operate. And I, like I said, full disclosure, I use so, uh, the carriage horses when I go to various places. I only go with horses that look to me like they're in excellent condition. I start asking questions of the drivers. I often investigate the companies quite a bit, but I've been very lucky. I've worked a lot with some of these carriage companies and many of them are working really hard to provide excellent care and welfare. I'm gonna use both terms to their animals. Um, however, the horse is upright. That horse slipped down on the pavement. And the problem is, how does he get up on the pavement? It's really hard for a horse with shoes on to get up on pavement. And so the more pictures that get taken, the more people have negative associations because people don't understand that it's impossible for a horse to get up on the pavement uh, with those shoes on. Uh, so what is our reaction to that? How do we handle that? Uh, obviously, if it's, if it's hot on the pavement, we don't want the horse laying there very often. What is our, that's where I started getting into large animal rescue stuff. How do we respond to these kind of things effectively and, and efficiently? Uh, the one on the right top, the horse is dead. Uh, they've done a really good thing there of Left covering top. the horse so that um, it doesn't offend or upset people that are going by. But of course, there's always people who are gonna raise cane about that. Why did the horse drop dead out there on, on the road? 
I don't know enough about that. That's just a random photo. Um, but the point being, they have challenges to their social license. And whether or not it's correct, uh, it's the old thing, Wendy. You know, you can take a picture of Rebecca riding her horses at at any moment in time, and that one thirtieth of a second that you take that photo, I might be doing something stupid. I might be pulling on my horse's face. I might be whatever. So it is. It's the old thing. Keyboard warriors get really um, busy with their comments on these things, but it's the overall picture that we see. Is it happening everywhere? And part of that comes down to how do we put better examples of what we're doing on a daily basis out there? So let me go back to where I was. Yep. Okay. So I hope everybody understands this concept of, you know, green to red, the levels of social license and some of the symptoms and indicators that show whether or not you have, uh, you could almost uh, say, I, I have got this social license to operate because I'm not having these problems. So what did we do? We did a whole 180 degree change in direction. In 2013, there was a UK organization that came up with a, a mannequin. Their name was Resquip, and they made this fantastic mannequin. It is $15,000. It's the most expensive horse I've ever bought. <laughs> oh. We have, uh, I think, 20 of them in the United States now. They have about 60 of them in the UK. And then there's uh, Australia, many other countries that do large animal rescue training. Uh, have these things. And we started realizing, hey, people are looking at us as how we ought to do these kinds of trainings, how we ought to be practicing. And we said, hey, you know, we want to be a leader in this. We're going to go ahead and invest in this mannequin and use that mannequin for any of the things where you have to put the animal in the mud, where you have to lift it off of its feet, those kind of things. So now when I do these trainings, I do some work with my horses as examples, but they are not getting their feet lifted off and they're not having to go into the mud. So those were the things where people were really concerned. Standing there and webbing around their body, they don't care. Asking them to lay down, they don't care. But some of these more uh, dangerous things, we decided we just weren't gonna do anymore, except with the mannequin. So Rebecca, can and I ask a question here? Yeah. Um, so, and this is just a, uh, you train someone with a mannequin, but a mannequin's not gonna kick you. Correct. How do you then- That's the problem. Exactly. So that's the problem. Train so them. What we do is, yeah. What we do is we spend a lot of time talking about how to stay in a safe position, that you always have to have your PPE on, whether you're a veterinarian or a firefighter or any other emergency responder. And with the mannequin, we only allow people to be in the correct positions. And if they get in the wrong position, we take them out of the evolution. We say, okay, you just got kicked in the head. You're over here. You have to, and it pulls people away from your team. So let's just say that you're doing training with six or eight people and you've got to manage this entire scene on the side of the road with a simulated trailer wreck. Now you've lost one of your people and they have to go to uh, be treated, treated by the uh, emergency, the EMTs. So now you've lost another person. So that's how we handle it. But the problem is, as you've highlighted, how do you train for the real thing? You only can train just like veterinarians do. You can only train for the real thing by attending the real thing. Yeah. And it's uh, sort of just in time training. It's on the job kind of training. So that's why people love to have gone to the old trainings where we actually put a, a live horse in the mud. But the option of putting a dead horse in the mud uh, was not well received. <laughs> Okay, so just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, I'm in this too. You know, I, I do these things for a living and I wanted to figure out a way to have better social license um, because there's thousands of people that work with me um, worldwide in large animal rescue and we want to set the best example. Okay, so just real quick. For those of you, yes. <laughs> uh, were one of your trained horses likely to kick a trainee or were they? No, never had them. It, we did it for uh, 15 years uh, with live horses. We never got anybody hurt. Thank goodness. Um, and they work for treats and they do all kinds of great things. But, uh, you know, it's just like you say, one of these days, somebody's going to get hurt, right? So uh, I think it was the right thing to, to, to change to the mannequin. Anyway, so if you're in the USA, uh, I will suggest to you that if you really want to learn something about how you deal with the public, this is free training. It's a one hour class. It's online 24 seven. You can access it. There's also a bunch of other classes that have to do with 
uh, emergency response and that kind of thing. But anybody can take this. If you own a business in the equine industry, I don't know why you wouldn't take a one hour class on public information because it gives you the basics for how do you deal with the public? How do you really handle an, a, a sense, scenario or an incident that happens to you and your business? And then of course, you can. there's plenty of other people that'll take your money if you wanna go out and get a class <laughs> of public information out there in the real world. But this is a minimum standard to me. I think everybody should take that. And you do have to get a student ID um, and then you can access hundreds of other courses that are on this site through FEMA. So to me, it's great. While you're there, get your training in livestock in disasters, animals in disasters. I'd love to see you do that too. But the real important thing here is the public information officer training. And as you've already pointed out, Wendy, you know, some of our discussions that we have in the horse industry, even those discussions may affect our social license to operate. So uh, the examples that I used here, I could have picked many examples, but you know, back and forth about whether or not you should trim your horse's whiskers. I've heard that my whole life. Full disclosure, I do not trim whiskers on my horses, okay? But I've heard that my whole life. And of course, now it makes it to social media and there's blogs and, you know, lots of other discussions where people are asking those kinds of questions. You see it in the horse magazines. You, you hear it when you listen to horse people talking. But when that is having the public out there also, they have access to that magazine just as well as we do. And sometimes these kinds of things make it into the general, you know, the New York Times and these kinds of, of places. And when that happens, the whole world is talking about it. Uh, the other example I'd use there is, you know, should the horses be in the barns? How often should they be in the barns? How long should they be in the barns? All the welfare issues that come with locking an animal up that should be getting a lot more um, exercise and be outside probably a lot more than some of these horses are. But that's a discussion that other people, when they see that, they start saying, hey, that's a cage. And next thing you know, horse people are not part of the, of the discussion anymore. It's the public that's part of the discussion. So other animal uh, issues, uh, particularly in the equine industry that we see, and I'm sure many of you have seen these, uh, the one in the upper right is uh, upper left is the gentleman that made a very bad decision to gallop his horse down the interstate in front of the police officers and ended up that horse was um, bleeding from his feet when he got off the horse. So that one was awful. Uh, you can guarantee that that got everybody talking about whether or not uh, people should be riding and, and making those kinds of decisions. And, and Whatever he, I don't even know what his issue was. I don't even know why he was doing this. Apparently it was to, to raise awareness of something. I wasn't even paying attention to that. I was looking at the horse and I was like, why are you running this horse? And, to, and he's, there's blood coming out of his feet. Ugh. Awful. Uh, the discussions about whether or not we weigh too much. Full disclosure, I'm 200 and something pounds, okay folks? So I'm real careful about which horses I get on. I have big, big horses, so I try to get on big horses. I am losing weight, 30 pounds in the last year, Wendy. But, uh, you know, whether or not we're too fat to ride. Um, nobody may like to talk about that, but obviously there are some situations where people should not be on the horse. On the other hand, there's other questions about, you know, you might be fat, but you're an excellent rider. What about people who are skinny, but they slop all over the horse? You know, is that more miserable to the horse from a welfare discussion? Um, some of the dumb things that people do and post on social media, this horse was being dragged by his owner because he, quote, wouldn't lead. And man, that made it all over Facebook. And, and once that happens, uh, especially since the person who posted it apparently was pretty proud of it. They said, oh, this horse is dumb. And so we fixed him. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that didn't go over real well. Um, discussions of bidding and nose bands and what kind of bits we use and whether or not you should be whipping horses. And obviously the thing that I get involved with is um, cruelty, starvation cases. Those are issues where people, you know, they, they see a horse out in the pasture and I get phone calls and my local law enforcement gets phone calls. Oh my God, these horses have got blindfolds on their eyes. And I'm like, no, it's a fly mask, people. But then we also get the phone calls from, hey, there's a bunch of horses that are skinny. And I go over and look at them and I'm like, oh, well, those are thoroughbreds or they're Arabians that are used for endurance and they are four, four and a half body condition scores. They're not big fat tanks. And then I go, well, why aren't people calling in when they see these horrifically fat 
eight and nine body condition scores, which you and I both know, Wendy, are absolutely disgusting and unhealthy for horses, why don't we ever get those calls? Because the public's not ed educated about that, right? They're educated about skinny, but they're not educated about fat. So those issues affect our current uh, social license to operate. And that affects everybody because people that are in the public, they just see a horse. They don't know the difference between an Arabian, a thoroughbred, uh, an eventing horse, an endurance horse, a pleasure horse. They just see a horse. And that's where we get ourselves in trouble. Oh, and Rebecca, Go ahead. Um, one of the things that's changed is that people are, are, they're not involved with horses the way they were when I was a kid, right? You didn't have the hack stables, you just, it's just, we're so much more removed, therefore there's so much less understanding of Correct. good versus bad. And that's, that, therein lies the problem because now people look at these pictures and they, they wouldn't know how to judge other than the extremes, but that's what gets um, promoted, right? And that's where we have to make sure that we're putting the good stuff out there on a regular basis, how we really do things. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of times when people are doing things in the barn or whatever, and there's speculation and there's all these things. Well, how are we really doing that? How did you really get that horse done? I mean, how did you really get that mane pull? You know, what was the horse's, uh, was the horse grimacing when you were pulling his mane? Did you have to drug him to get whatever done? You know, I have a horse that when I got it, it was pretty well understood that you probably needed to drug the horse to get anything done with it. And over the years, I made sure that he got to the point where we didn't have to do those things. But that was sort of the the daily expectation was that if you wanted to do anything with him, you were going to drug him. And to me, that was not acceptable. So how do we deal with those kinds of, of expectations? When you go to a horse show and you see all these boxes where people are putting their drug um, stuff, yeah. their yeah. syringes and things, that makes the public walk around and say, what the hell is that for? I mean, how often are they really drugging these horses? I mean, is that really part of what you have to do to get on a horse? So we have to, as an industry, we've got to accept, accept that those are issues and that we've got to be part of that conversation in social license to operate. So, so Maria's made a comment and she says, people don't have the same interactions with horses as they did a generation ago. I agree. I would think it's better that someone makes Absolutely. a call about a concern and have it be nothing than for people to turn a blind eye. Absolutely. And while you're talking about the people that do have and, and you know, how they see things, look in the back of these pictures at the top. What do you see? You see thousands of people. Those are the public. Those are many times people who do not have any other, you know, people love horses. And that's their only time to actually see a horse up close because they don't have that interaction, as you've said. But they go to the races or they go to the chuck wagon races or they go to the rodeo and they see what they see. So we have to make sure that it is as good welfare and care as possible, which means to me, this is Rebecca talking only, that if you bring a really skinny, nasty horse to an event that the veterinarian says, eh, ixnay, that's not gonna happen. And we're going to do something about that right now. And that's where we've really got to get a, a little bit better because there are horses that are brought to races and, and chuck wagon races and to rodeos that are lame and have problems and either uh, look skinny or they're coughing or they're whatever, and they're still allowed to participate. And that's where we got to lock up a little bit more. And we'll talk about that in a second. So this just happens to be some things where, you know, the truck wagon races and the rodeo, they've had some challenges to whether or not they have the social license to operate. Racing is probably the best example of having problems. And actually, Thoroughbred Racing Commentary had a blog, you know, social license to operate. What can we do to keep it sustainable? So they're already understanding in the racing industry that we've got to do something or we're going to lose what we have as social license. And that has translated in lots of racetracks that have shut down, the number of horses that are born, the number of races that, that are out there um, as they have lost some of their social license to operate. And they're starting to realize it. But at what point do others of us in the industry realize that if it's happening in racing, it affects us too. 
right. you know, we think, wow, it's the Olympics and it's great. And look at these horses. But there's a lot of people who are like, oh, man, what are they doing to those horses? So we are all in this together. And we've got to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that our aspect, whether you're dressage or you're Western pleasure or you're doing rodeo or you're even a trail rider, that you're doing all the right things. This is probably the best example I can think of uh, of an organization that's basically lost their social license to operate. Uh, many people are aware of Big Lick. If you're not aware of Big Lick, I don't have enough time to really go into the details here, but this is what the Horse Protection Act back in 1970 was um, legislated for, was to try to prevent some of the horrific things that were happening in this. Sadly, it's still happening all these years later. And uh, I do work with HSUS and some other organizations. I've been involved with them for many, many years. Uh, the past act that we're trying to get going to try to stop some of this ridiculousness. And it's awful that we have to go to legislation to get people to stop doing something that's just for a stupid ribbon. But when you're talking about $100,000 uh, stallion fees, it's sort of hard. That's what I mean about once you got money involved, sort of hard to get people to stop. So some of the, the choices that the Tennessee walking horse industry has made as far as showing these big horses have been pretty awful. And uh, the fact that we've had to have legislation and law lawyers involved for over 50 years now is uh, just, it's, it's unconscionable. So this is another, ex go ahead. Well, has this, has Big Lick changed at all based on the, you know, the legal stuff that they're trying to do or do they just ignore it? They have, well, they, they are forced by USDA to do uh, some very amazing things where they, they have fluorescence uh, microscopy to be able to look and see if you've got nails shoved up in your horse's feet or if you've used blister agents and those kind of things. But like the example there, how do you handle somebody that wants to get on uh, basically a two-year-old and ride it? I mean, look at the size of that guy on that, on that baby. That's riding baby horses. That's just... <laughs> How do you stop that? I mean, that's awful. But then you look back at racing and when do they start racing? At two. So that's what I mean by how do we get involved in this? And, and, and what's the, the slippery slope, right? Uh, how, how do we do these things? Uh, in general, Big Lick is down significantly. There's very few people that are involved in Big Lick, uh, unless you go to Tennessee, um, showing. But there are some other breeds that do some showing that's very similar to this. It's not this awful, um, but I certainly raise my eyebrows at some of the things that they're doing with Saddlebreds and Morgans and um, Show Arabians. Uh, it's a slippery slope. How far do you go on saying you shouldn't be doing that? And how does that affect us in our industry um, when people say, well, you shouldn't be riding horses either, Rebecca. So I don't wanna lose the chance to, to ride my horses. I get lo lots of enjoyment out of it but I would definitely not want to be sitting, I'm about that guy's size, and I would not be sitting on a 18, 19 month old baby, um, having it up on stacks, um, making it work. So that's, that's awful. Other organizations uh, related to animals that have essentially lost their social license to operate. As you guys know, Ringling, Ringling Brothers, uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus was around for 140 something years, and, and they slide, retired their open Your slide's really delayed. When you change them, it just it finally came up. Okay. Okay. Uh, the the circus folks essentially in the United States have lost their social license to operate many of the animal acts. You just don't find those at the circuses anymore. There's lots of people things doing all kinds of flying Walinda kind of things, but we don't see that so much with the animals. And uh, that was something that was that was coming. There were some really bad training operations things that were being done. And once that got out to the public and the public realized it, the public basically stopped going to circuses. And then, of course, there was many organizations that were um, legally challenging whether or not you had the social license to operate. And eventually they just went out of business. They couldn't fight the legal $25 million um, acts and those kinds of things. So that's, you know, that's where we could be. And that's why we've got to get involved with this. And that's why I'm opening up this conversation today, because. I think it's important that we start to look around at ourselves and say, how do we, how do we do a better job? And part of that, this is all based on Julie Fiedler. She's a friend of mine in Adelaide, Australia. Um, she's right now working on her PhD. She gave a presentation at the International Society, 
Society for Equ Equitation Science, ISIS. Uh, I don't know how many of you are members of that. It amazes me how many people are not members of that. <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't even know about that organization. It's it's involved with behavior and welfare in, in the equestrian industry and how we do these things and looking at the science of how do we uh, involve ourselves with horses and is it a good idea to do these particular things. So the scientists and the researchers are really starting to take a look at um, how much pressure are we putting on the horse's face uh, with our nose bands and our bits and uh, how do you assess animal welfare and those kinds of things. So really some of the things that she pointed out this at this presentation back in 2019 in Guelph was, you know, the general public's response really has a long lasting impact on the equine industry. And really what that means is once you put it on social media, it's there, baby, it ain't leaving. It's gonna be on there for, for forever. And the long digital life on social media allows us to take a look at these things, judge them, screenshot them, analyze them, condemn them if we're going to, um, both in the horse industry and by the general public. And of course, you know, Wendy, a picture can be taken totally out of context and that's where we get ourselves in trouble. So we've got to do the right things to make sure that we don't lose our long-term ability to do activities and sports with horses. Um, there is a movement even among horse owners uh, to say, hey, you know, I want to own horses, but I'm not going to ride them. And I don't think other people should ride them. And it's coming. And so we've got to get better at how we handle those kind of things. I don't know what the answers are. I'm not the, you know, cultural anthropologist, but I listen to the cultural anthropologists that are saying, hey, folks, we need to take a look at this. So my real concern and the reason I'm talking today is because when I talk about social license, in other places, um, whether it's Australia or the UK or Canada, uh, they have a pretty good idea of what social license is. It's been a part of their culture for a while, and we really haven't been talking about it here in the equestrian industry here in the United States. Those are just a couple examples. The one I wanna highlight is the one in green at the bottom left, um, which is Raleigh Over Overs. He is the, a veterinarian, and he is the chief executive at World Welfare. And he gave a lecture in 2017 and has given numerous lectures since up to the FEI about equestrian sport and the concept of a social license. So that was what, five, six years ago or five years ago, I guess now. So some of the recommendations, I sort of boiled them down to these kind of things. And you guys can read the slide yourself, but I'll point out a few things. First of all, don't ignore it. <laughs> If we try to ignore, oh, well, there's not really a problem, that's where we really get ourselves at, at, you know, we've got to monitor these things, we've got to assess these things. We need to be proactive. We gotta be able to respond to that public opinion. As your um, uh, peer just pointed out, you know, we should, it's better to say something and not be a problem than to not say something. Uh, we need to engage with those concerns. Uh, we need to seek independent views on whether or not we're doing the right things. Uh, honesty and transparency. We talk about those kind of things, but again, you know, I go to the backside of the tracks. I go to the backside of the, the show rings. I sit out and watch what goes on when people are loading and unloading their horses at various things. And I just shake my head and I go, wow, if somebody ever gets a picture of you loading your horse on a trailer, that's going to be all over the internet because you don't know what you're doing. You know how to do a a, a rain and slide, or you know how to do a pee stuff or a pee off or whatever it is, but you don't know how to load your horse in a trailer. In fact, you don't even know how to lead your horse. So, you know, when do we as an industry start saying, hey, you guys need to get a little bit better about this. The biggest thing he pointed out there was there should be zero tolerance required on anything that harms our perception of welfare. You bring a skinny horse to a show, done. You bring a horse that's lame or tired, obviously exhausted, the veterinarian should evaluate it and it should be out. And probably for most of these things, there should be some kind of a fine or something. And that means zero tolerance. And when the horse industry starts looking around and saying, you know, uh, my, my big thing that I see is, oh, well, he's just a pasture pet. And I go, he's a 35 year old pasture pet that's about a two body condition score and he hasn't had his dental done in years and he hasn't had his shots done. And he hasn't had his feet done. That's not a pasture pet. That is abuse. That is something where you have neglected that animal. And that's not, that's not cool. 
But people say, but I love my horse. And I go, yeah, but you still got to spend money on it. And that's just one example of, you know, our reputation. Um, those acts of abuse, whether it's, it's intended or just failure to provide, those things affect everybody. Um, he is the one that pointed out that the, chief, the horse should be the chief stakeholder in all of these discussions about social license, whether it's care or welfare, uh, discussion of social license, the chief, the chief stakeholder is the horse. It's not the business, it's not the humans, it's the horse. Uh, action three was, you know, the relevance of the sector. I think we do a pretty good job of marketing what we do with horses, um, but articulating that relevance of doing that and then highlighting that horse and human partnership. Wendy, that's something that ISIS has really been involved with is trying to uh, assess those things, quantify as researchers that uniqueness of that horse-human partnership and whether it's in sport or, or just enjoying our horses and then, of course, demonstrating our, our respect for horses. So Raleigh has been really pushing this uh, even at, at the FEI level and around the world. If you ever get a chance to listen to one of his online presentations, you really ought to. He is obviously the person who's the guru at doing this. So when we talk about welfare and the last part of this, uh, I know I'm short on time, so I'm going to okay, go on. We don't okay. have to stop. OK, good. Yeah. Uh, assessing horse well, well-being objectively, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, everybody thinks they know, you know whether that horse is in good welfare or not. And, and Wendy, I'm just going to tell you, this is Rebecca's personal opinion. It has nothing to do with anybody else. I sometimes walk through barns and everybody's like, wow, look at these horses. They're so beautiful and they're so healthy and they're those old things. And, and I want to cry because those horses never go out or they go out for an hour or they go out for four hours in a paddock. And the paddock is like 20 by 20. And, and I'm looking at them and I'm like, these poor horses. I mean, do you know what a horse wants to do? He wants to run and buck. Well, you can't do that. I go to very exclusive horse barns with amazing horses that do high school level things. And I asked one of those places who shall remain nameless, do your horses, do your stallions ever actually get out and run? And they go, no, you can't let them do that. They'll hurt themselves. And I said, you have an arena right there. They've never been allowed to run loose in that arena. No, they stand in their standing stalls or they get worked. That's how they get their exercise. That horse is 24 years old, and in his whole life, since he was pulled from a pasture at four, he has never run loose. Are you kidding me? That's welfare. That's the question I got to ask. So the five freedoms model was developed back in 1979 for a little history over in the UK, and they talked about freedom from hunger and thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, and disease, fear and distress, and the freedom to behave normally. And over the years, the um, OIE, which is the World Organization for Animal Health, they took a look at that model and they said, hey, we really need to sort of work on that and update that regularly. They started doing that in 1994. And they sort of generalized into these categories of nutrition, environment, health, behavior, and mental experiences. You guys can read the rest of the stuff on that slide. Um, the problem really for horses is that a very well-known a bunch of researchers got together in 2017 that were welfare professionals and researchers and riders and all these kind of things and they got to together with this and started trying to assess this problem of welfare of of whether or not these animals needed more time outside whether or not they were exhibiting behavioral problems all those kinds of things and what they found was if you used that 1994 or five domains model and the five freedoms model, that there was some inaccurate assumptions where people were making a scoring system and they weren't really understanding what they were looking at. And so they said, hey, we need to come up with a good, simple scoring system. We need to come up with a way to educate people to do these evaluations. So that you, in your own barn, at home, away from FEI and away from all these other things, you don't need some, you know, veterinarian to come in the door and tell you whether or not you've got good welfare for your horses. Not just care, but welfare. And so they started trying to come up with a better way to do that. And this is the 2025 domains model. Um, one of my friends at Horses and People, Christina Wilkins, she did a great job of coming up with this 
picture. And it doesn't matter what animal you're talking about. It could be lab rats, it could be horses, it could be donkeys, it could be pigs or giraffes in a zoo. But what they're looking at is the physiological domain, which is the care, okay? The health and fitness, the living environment, the nutrition, you've got the best feed, you've got the best hay, you've got all these things. But then they also started looking at the behavioral domain. How does that animal interact with other animals? How does it interact with humans? How does it interact with the environment? Um, is it normal for it to be pinning its ears? Is it normal for it to be standing in the corner and looking depressed? Do horses get depression? All those kinds of things. And then they said those two parts, the physiological and the behavioral domains, come together into domain five, which really is the, the mental state of these animals, um, which con communicates to their welfare. And so that's a, a pictorial way of looking at these kinds of things. If you guys, if you're smart enough to be sitting on this webinar, you're smart enough to read this paper, okay? I'm not gonna, <laughs> I don't have the time here to read it to you or go through it, but there's two ways to access it. You can go through the, the Animals Magazine, uh, the, the publication for 2020, that's the link to it, or you can go through MDPI, and you will find the 2025 domains model, including human animal interactions in assessments of animal welfare. So how to actually assess what we're doing from a positive or a negative way of doing this. Um, and really, Wendy, I thought the most awesome point that they had in this was humans affect horses no matter whether we want to or not. We make those decisions. Do you get room to run around in? Do you get good food? Do you get good hay? Do you have a safe trailer to get onto? Do you have a safe barn that you're going into at night? All those kind of things. Everything for that domesticated horse is made by humans. So normally we talk about horse behavior, but really it's totally interlinked with human behavior because if we provide or fail to provide, which can be either one, any of those kinds of things, we can have negative and positive effects. And some of those things may not be as important as others. But what we find over time is we're starting to understand that the wide range of human animal interactions is important to evaluating that animal welfare. So I'm going to try to give you guys some Again, high level perspectives of this. What I did was I pulled down a, a lot of information and I've tried to synthesize it here. I still encourage you, if you're really interested in this, that you should look at the original paper to understand this five domains model and the specific guidance for um, assessment of welfare. Okay, so in a big picture, examples of situations where there's negative welfare impacts, okay? and animals had minimal human contact, and then you go in and try to catch it, okay? That's a good example. Um, where the human presence adds to already threatening circumstances. I've got a Hanoverian mare who I have worked, I've had her for 10 years, and we've been working for 10 years with my vet to get her used to, she's always been very worried about vaccines and, and uh, having her blood taken, those kind of things. And we've been successful, and every single time we interact with her and work with, um, making sure that she's not as afraid of that. It's amazing. We've gotten to the point where she will actually stand there. She knows, you know, one of the things I always tell people is, when's the only two times that two humans ever approach a horse? Hmm. It's either the farrier, the vet, or the trainer. The farrier is gonna pick their feet up, up, take them off their balance. The vet is gonna inject something or assess something or put their arm in their rear end or whatever, some, you know, possibly noxious thing. And then what does the trainer do? They tighten the girth, they tighten the nose band, they do something that's that's noxious. So horses, they get real, their eyebrows go up and they go, ooh, you know, what the heck's going on here? Okay, they're not dumb. So uh, anything that can be threatening or noxious uh, or aversive to the horse. And of course, you know, they, they learn real quick, as we all know. And then of course, um, unintended harms. The things where, you know, all of us have done it, Wendy, you're holding onto a broom, and you accidentally drop it just at the wrong time. The horse panics and runs. Uh, the other day, I was going trail riding with some friends and a girlfriend of mine, she's really short, so she brought a silly little fly swatter like you use at the house, and she was gonna swat flies up on the horse, the deer flies, because she's too short to reach all the way up on the horse's thing. The horse she was riding was like, whatever, 
my horse was like, oh my God, you've got a flash water. You know, so it was an unintended consequence. My horse jumped 10 feet when she went whack. The horse she was riding on was like, whatever, I don't care. Uh, and yes, she did kill the horse fly, but <laughs> my horse was, she took it as, you know, a bad thing. So that, that comes with unintended harms. And then the positive things, you know, where we're engaging in, in various things, we're doing good training. Um, we provide that sense of safety and comfort that the horses want. We, we play with our horse. And, and you know, I, that's a, one of those things that I really work on is, is it fun for the horse too? Are they getting a chance to have a, a decision in this? And then of course, um, when, when we stop, the things that I involve with law enforcement, deprivation, innovation, or, or harm, where we step and we loosen that girth or we loosen that, um, that too tight uh, thing that maybe the kid doesn't understand. They, they watch TV and they think they have to crank it down or whatever. And really that comes down to, you know, the, this, this paper has made it easier to emphasize what we talk about in welfare is the three Fs for horses, the friends, forage, and freedom, and the quality of those horse-human interactions. Because sometimes if the only thing they ever deal with with humans is you catch them in the field, you catch them in the stall, you lead them to the wash rack, you lead them to the arena, you ride the snot out of them, and then you lead them back. I mean, after a while, if I was a horse, I'd be like, oh, here comes that human again. And people wonder why they don't want to get caught, right? So what I've done is I have cut these out for all the folks that are interested in reading this in detail. And I'm, I'm just going to run over them real quick and highlight a few things. You guys that are watching this as not the live presentation can stop it. This is how you take a look at your behavioral interactions and their effects that may affect your horse. You know, some negative and positives on how you do these things and our exigency in um, how we do these things. Does the horse have agency? Does the horse get to have a vote in how we do these things? And that's something that's, for a lot of people, they say, that's not the horse's, that, the horse doesn't get a vote. I go, well, maybe they do get a vote. And sometimes they take that vote when they really act out. Uh, they buck, they kick, they do those kind of things. But that's not the kind of agency we're looking for. We're looking for that horse to, to be involved with us and want to be there. Okay. So again, you can stop this if you're watching the non-live presentation and read it in detail. But this is examples of some interactions that are likely to, to get those negative effects, you know, near animals that have never been caught. You're catching wildlife uh, in some cases. Remember, this is for all animals, but it also could affect, you know, are you, are you working with a BLM Mustang? It's never had much prior human contact. It got caught and put a halter on it, but that doesn't mean that it's a domesticated animal. Um, we already talked about some of the things from veterinarians. So I encourage you guys to read through those. What are some ways that we can generate some positive effects? You know, do we do some... Do we do the same thing every day or we change up what we do? Uh, I always try to make things a little bit different. I set up puzzles at my place. I open different gates for the horses to get different places and see if they can figure it out. It's sort of a fun thing for them and it's a fun thing for me. And then of course, uh, if you have that strong bond that you've built with your animal, it doesn't mean your horse loves you. Your horse doesn't love you. He doesn't, he loves you because you feed him, but you wanna have that bond. And there's nothing like having your horse when you call him come to you, Wendy, as you know, he comes to you and he's like, hi, and he, you can look at his body language and you realize that he wants to be with you. And that's what we're really looking for. Okay. So how do we do this? This is the most important slide out of the whole thing. And this really comes down to a way to measure what we're doing. And so this is all that work from Meller and uh, McGreevy and McLean uh, down in, in Australia. And uh, they have put this together in a way for us as horse people to say, what is the nature of our interaction and sort of grade it. Um, the lower end versus the higher end being positive, uh, a little bit higher, uh, neutral or zero would be that it's sort of negative or aversive, those kinds of things. And the way they did this is sort of cool because if any of these totals add up to a zero, then you get a zero for the whole level. All right. So what that means is that you can get a zero, a four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So there's either a zero or a four, which is pretty minimal. 
But what you do is you give yourself a point for each one of these things where you're doing these good things. And then you measure what you're doing as far as your assessment. So this is, offers us a way to numerically look at what are we doing? Are we trying to spend more time with our horses that is optimal, not just grooming it and leading it and doing things with it? Or are we actually take that time to do the screechy scratchies? Are we taking the time to do the stretches? Are we taking the time to look at the lameness of this horse um, are in our own way? Because it's amazing, Wendy, if you let somebody else look at your horse, they can tell you it's lame real quick. Can't they? And often another horse person can look at your relationship with that horse and they can say, man, you've got a great relationship with that horse or man, that horse does not like you. So sometimes it comes out to we have to step away from this and get somebody else to take a look and it might be a friend it might be another horse person it might be our veterinarian because sometimes we just can't see these things ourselves so this is really the the money slide here for how we're taking a look at doing this and of course they're coming up with things that we can share with horse people on all the details of this you know how good is it this happens to be for all animals again you can stop this and read it in detail if you're watching the um the published version of this uh, webinar. Uh, but there's a lot of details here at, that they've pulled out on how we do these kinds of things. Are you using calm methods for training? Are you using brutal methods? Are you always in a hurry? Are you, you know, I'm, I've got 30 days to train this horse and by God, he's gonna get this done. Or are you like, hey, I need to stop. I've, I've spent 20 minutes with him and obviously his brain is full and I'm gonna put him back and go do something with him later. Um, those kinds of examples are what we've got to look at at ourselves. And being humans and being predators, working with a prey animal, the horse, we have to be very aware of how we do these kind of things. And then, of course, the things that we have always thought were welfare and often fall into care as well is how do we deal with enough food and water and the nutrients and those kind of things? How do we deal with their their thermal, uh, you know, their physical environmental conditions, whether it's thermal or, you know, do we leave them out, do we leave them in? Hey, there's a tornado coming. That's what people always ask me in large animal rescue, right? There's a tornado coming, leave him out, leave him in. And I'm like, just go take your family and get in the shelter, you know? The horse can take care of himself. In fact, he's probably better at it than you are. But the point being, um, how do we provide shelter? How do we uh, determine whether or not the animal's suffering at those kinds of things? I live in Georgia, Wendy, and I see a lot of people put blankets on horses, and I go. And then I have friends up in Al Alberta, you know, it's getting down to 40 degrees below zero, and they're like, well, okay, 40 degrees, and he's 25 years old, so I'm finally going to put a blanket on him. But as you know, there's a wide range of how old is the horse, has he been, sh has he been um, clipped, has he, all those things, they come into that thing. So what they're trying to do with this paper is to give us better ways to objectively score whether or not we should be doing those kind of things. And then of course, health conditions. This is the one where the veterinarians really get involved. Uh, and when you bring a horse to a show uh, uh, that they should be looking at, what is, is this animal weak? Is this animal sick? Is this animal healthy? Uh, what is his vitality level? Uh, I don't know whether you noticed or not, but they just finished the Tevis and there was a 20 something year old walking horse, Wendy, that actually finished um, that was great. And then there was an 81 year old man that finished the, the Tevis also. So that was pretty cool. So, you know, and they looked like they were in good shape and the endurance people, they worked really hard at that whole concept of social license, right? They, they have the veterinarians involved. They're doing the individual assessments of those animals all the way through. And part of the reason they've had to do that is because they had some people that were making bad decisions in the past. So again, health condition being part of it. So this is the last slide. And what, what am I really getting down here is I'm really saying that individuals and stakeholders and organizations that are a part of our equine industry, which is every single one of us, and I don't care if you're a kid or you're an adult, you are part of this. We have got to potentiate and promote our positive interactions with horses. We've got to get people involved with horses. We've got to understand that the public can't see what we're really doing until we put it up on social media. So we need to be real careful about what we show as being something that we accept our social license to operate is in their hands. And as a fundamental building block of social li license to operate, 
that regular assessment of equine welfare really needs to become a standard practice. It shouldn't be, Wendy, it's amazing to me how many people don't know how to do a body condition score. We're all part of the equine industry. Why is it just that animal control officers and equine law, uh, law enforcement officers know how to do a body condition score? Why is it just that researchers know how to do a body condition score? An actual body condition score where you can download the form and you can do it yourself. That should be part of our standard best practice. We should be able to address this paper that they've been talking about, equine welfare. It should be part of our normal conversations with horses to talk about welfare and know the difference between care and welfare and know what a social license to operate is. So that's why I brought this up today. Wendy, I really appreciate you giving us a platform to put this out there for people to make that discussion. I am by no means an expert in any aspect of this. I just think it's important. I think we need to have those discussions. And I know that there's some folks that would like to say these things, but they really can't because they're part of an organization or they're involved in something where they're really worried about saying it. So, you know, well, Rebecca, I'm really willing to say anything. So. If you need to get a hold of me, that's how you get a hold of me. I've got a study group for technical large animal emergency rescue out there. If you're interested in that, uh, there's about 15,000 people on it. That's my personal email and my cell phone. Text me before you call me and I, because I, I don't take weird calls. And uh, other than that, Wendy, I will take your questions. So, uh, you know, Rebecca, it's such an inter interesting discussion and it, it, and on the one, yeah, okay, so what do I want to say here? You know, when I go over to Europe, there, the social license is very different yes. because they have integrated horses into society. In other words, you have a barn in a neighborhood surrounded by housing where people take their kids to go and learn to ride. Yes, yes these horses are in, they're no, they don't have turnout. They have walkers. They have maybe a paddock for a little while, but they are exercised. And they have the social license to have the horses like this and they do take care of the horses. So one of the things that I find, you know, it, horses are amazing at adapting. And I mm -hmm. think that we have to really consider, you know, it's so easy to judge to say and I, that the horse in this condition, it shouldn't be that way. It should be in this condition. You, but you can't say that because you have to look at the environment, the culture, the space the conditions and, and make an assessment on in that environment, in that situation, as opposed to from Colorado trying to assess Germany. And I think yeah. it's so important for people to realize that because there, there are different ways that we can keep horses. Maybe it's not the way you or I might want to keep their horse, but it is working. And I think more importantly, it is keeping people connected to horses. And that's absolutely my, that right? connection is important. And that you are exactly right, Wendy. Yeah. I, and, and that's why they're coming up with this ability to make that assessment because, you know, there's we don't want to get into the whole regulation thing where some group has to come to your barn and look and see if you, you know, are doing the right thing for your horses. It should be that we should embrace that and say, hey, you know, this is something I want to make sure that I've got good welfare for my animals. Right. And so how can I do that? Give me a tool. Give me an assessment tool. And I know that they're working on trying to get something that's an app or something so that people, individuals can actually take a look at that and say, hey, where am I on this spectrum of, you know, why are other people looking at me like I'm not doing the right thing? And, you know. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, it, you cannot take a look at what somebody else is doing unless you look at the entire picture. Now, right. sometimes, you know, I'm looking at taking in a whole bunch of 30 not well taken care of horses locally uh, here because someone hasn't been feeding them and taking care of them. Sometimes law enforcement has to step in because you haven't done any of the things that you're supposed to do from a welfare perspective. But generally for most people, I think the problem is they think that they're doing good things, they're doing care, but they're not really doing welfare. And they need to educate themselves more about welfare. And what I'll do, Wendy, is I am going to try to get 
some, I've got two people who would be excellent to talk about welfare in detail with you. Awesome. And you know me, I'm going to hand great. you over to right them. Up. I love it. <laughs> and let them explain that in more detail. Because again, I am not the expert when it comes to these things. I work really hard to educate myself, but I am not holding myself out to be the expert on any of that aspect. I well, just, and, and I think Lorna's, this discussion is important. Yeah, Lorna is saying that she taught animal welfare at a large university for many years and did two classes on equine welfare. The most pushback I ever got from students was from the equine industry students. Um, and welfare is from the perspective of the animal, not the country discipline or money. Yes, and that, but, but what I'm trying to say there is the environment could be completely different from what someone else thinks and it's still okay. I mean, yep. because- and, and that's the thing like with uh, mounted police horses, it's interesting that we have uh, you know, the, the carriage horses have so many people that say, oh, that's awful. But in the same town, you know, I work with the New York Mounted uh, Police. Yeah. And they're, it's amazing how much social license they have where people are like, oh, this is awesome. You know, they've got these horses. Well, they're walking on the same streets that yeah. the carriage horses are walking on. And they're carrying them. They? <laughs> that's right there and that's the thing you know the the carriage horses they're they're pulling which is actually a lot easier than carrying somebody but the perception is that that somehow that's worse and and I, i'm not sure why but uh you know i i've always thought that that was sort of a conundrum because they're on the exact same streets and walk by each other and people will look at the mounted police horse and go wow that's awesome and then look at the carriage horse and say there's something wrong with that and i go have you ever pulled a carriage <laughs> you can actually pull it yourself, you know? Or have you uh, ever anyway. stood with a weight of a rider on your back for an hour not moving, you know? That's right. And yeah. so, so uh, Maria is saying you bring up a good point. There are people who want to say these things, but are fearful due to an organization or association with which they are yes. involved. This yes. to me is a problem that perpetuates the cycle of not putting the welfare of the horse first. This needs to shift and shift quickly, but how to break the cycle. And, and, I, and the other point I want to make is that that in many cases, if you take your animal to the vet, they're gonna get better care than a human in a hospital. Yeah. So, you know, we, we recognize welfare for our animals, but where is the welfare for people? Yep. <laughs> in so many and circumstances. That is absolutely true. And actually this case that I'm talking about where they're looking at having to take these horses, it really comes down to the person's welfare because she hasn't been able to make some of the decisions for herself because she loves her horses so much, she's spent all her money and time and effort and everything else. Sadly, she's so much older and she has some other um, issues of mobility and probably mental health and those kind of things. So now, you know, she's faced with losing her horses because nobody's done the right thing for her, but nobody knew to step in and she's pretty, got a lot of angst on those kind of things. So at what point do we as a society say, you have lost your personal social license to operate with these animals because you've had some welfare impacts. But should we have stepped in as a society earlier and said, hey, instead of having 30 horses, why don't you go down to four, you know, or something like that. But that's hard to do, right? Because yeah. I don't know about you, Wendy, but I don't want somebody telling me what to do with my horses. So again, it's a slippery slope. Where does somebody make that decision? And um, where do we step in? It's, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing is difficult. And I, and the thing that's accelerated this, and you brought this out very clearly, the thing that's accelerated it more than anything is the internet. Because, yeah. because something can be put on the internet and be global in seconds. Yeah. And I find with the internet, it's still in its teenage years and it's like picky 12, 13 year old age where yeah. we haven't developed enough of us moral sense of how we interact with the internet. Um, and so it's putting more than just animals in, in jeopardy. Look at what it's doing to children with Instagram, trying to change what they look like in order to get likes, uh, you know? So there's a lot of, um, it brings up so many other issues. <laughs> I got, you know, I got slapped by Facebook the other day. Uh, there was a discussion on an, an animal that really was pretty, bad shape and i made the comment on facebook that you know i would have shot it because i would have shot it if it was my personal animal and i got slapped by facebook for that they were like oh we're not going to put that up and i'm like oh, okay i should have found a better way to say that 
But to me, it's normal part of my conversation to say, you know, if you got to euthanize something, you're going to shoot it. Apparently, you can't do that on Facebook anymore. So you're right. And that's where, you know, these, these algorithms are making decisions for us. These uh, supposed Facebook checkers or whatever are looking at these things. We've got a long way to go in social media and how we do these things and the keyboard warriors. And, and I mean, I've been learning along the way, too. So it, I've, I've been slapped several times. <laughs> I've done some things where I've sort of pulled the pin out of the grenade, thrown it out on Facebook <laughs> and then and got slapped. But hey, I learned a lot too. And sometimes I do that on purpose because I know I'm gonna generate a discussion and those discussions are how I learn. And um, sometimes I realize, ooh, I probably stepped over the curb on that one. But you know, I learn a lot from other people's perceptions because we only have our own dis 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 perception of things depending on how educated we are in a subject. And we only have one life and you can only learn so much. And I don't know about you, Wendy, but I have to sleep at least eight hours a night. So <laughs> you're sort of limited by the time you should shower and shave and you know, sleep, then what else? You know, how many other hours in the day you got? And if you're watching webinars with Wendy all the time, it takes a lot of time away. I really appreciate it. Uh, well, she's just got a comment. I'm always shocked to see how many people don't know who to call when they see a concerning situation with animals. That information needs to be readily available as someone's smartphone. And um, just to point out that we have done webinars with the at Hillman from um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Days End Horse Farm, Horse Farm Rescue. Rescue. Right. Yep. Um, and so for the state of Maryland, she's very interesting. Um, she's done some, so you can go and I highly recommend you watch those. You know, it's 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 a huge topic that we've opened up here. It's a huge topic, mm -hmm. and it's not one that we're ever going to have the definitive right answer for every single situation um, because we're never going to know all of it. But we have to do the best we can with what we know. And you know, your animal control person is your first point of call if you see something going on. Um, right? Is an animal control. Absolutely. Animal, well, every every county or every jurisdiction is different. It may be animal control, it may be animal welfare, it may be animal services. And sadly, in many counties here in Georgia and other uh, poor counties, it may just be your sheriff's department. Um, there's many counties that do not have an actual animal welfare, animal services, animal control group. But you should know that well before something happens. And just like they always say, if you see something, say something. And if you can't find local, um, you know, help, and they, you you pick up the phone and call somebody and say, ah, whatever, um, you keep generating uh, discussion and and keep raising that issue to others until you find somebody at the state level or the national level even that's willing to step up and do those kind of things. Uh, it is important to let law enforcement do their job. So you're involved in an actual case, you need to keep your mouth shut and continue doing whatever you're doing as far as um, documenting the situation. But uh, I don't like to put those things on Facebook or say anything until- <laughs> That is not the time for Facebook, from right. <laughs> law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right, well, Rebecca, once again, it's been fabulous to have you. Uh, you've brought up a, a huge topic and hopefully you will have some guests that we can break this down a little bit more because it needs to be i think it needs to be unpacked some of those slides certainly love to unpack them i sure will i'm gonna hook you up with raleigh very very soon oh awesome that's great awesome all right well thank you so much and thank you everybody for joining us um this week we're doing stolen horses with uh debbie metcalf on thursday so stay tuned for that one Yay. one of rebecca's uh hook. <laughs> she hooked her in <laughs> <laughs> yes that's awesome well thank right. you very much wendy a great have day. a great day bye